Ports of Call. Beyond blue horizons far at the world's end, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Ports of Call. We rise and fall on the bosom of the Pacific, feeling the trade winds soft caress, convoyed by the ghostly memories of old clipper ships that blazed the trail we now follow, part of the coastline of Australia, the last discovered continent lies before us, nestling beneath mountains that rise majestically in the distance like blue-clad sentinels of nature, barring the way to the vast beyond. Basking in the bright sunlight, Sydney, mother city of Australia, like a jewel set in a sapphire sea, beckons us from the cool, refreshing waters of Port Jackson. No smoky, grimy port is this, but rippling silk that holds the hues of heaven. We go past sandy beaches until, beyond the harbor, we see the richly colored sandstone buildings of Sydney rising gracefully against the cloudless sky. And from the terraces of the botanic gardens, the incense of magnolia blooms made faint by distance pervades the air as we come to rest in Sydney Harbor, Port Jackson. It was in 1768 when that intrepid explorer, Captain Cook, having visited New Zealand, turned the rounded bows of the endeavor toward uncharted waters, and anchoring in an unknown bay, headed the first civilized party to land and plant a flag on the east coast of Australia. Lay to it, my lads. I want to come within hailing distance of those natives on shore. Is there any danger of those blacks using canoes to cut us off from the ship, Captain Cook? I don't think so, Mr. Banks. I doubt me if they've ever heard a gun fired. I warrant it would stop them quickly if they tried any such tactics. What are you gazing so intently at, Isaac? Those fish down there, sir. The bay seems to be teeming with them. Yes, quite a number of stingrays among them. Hmm, that's a good name for this place, Stingray Bay. What do you think of the land, Mr. Pickersgill? Quite a fertile place, sir. Well wooded. Must be well watered, too. That'll do, men. Rest on your oars. I'm going to hail those natives before we get too close. Better watch those throwing spears, sir. I think we're still out of range. Hold a bow on shore, mister, and be ready to backwater if necessary. Aye, aye, sir. Ahoy, there! Ahoy! Why, bless my soul. Look at them scatter. They're all making for the trees. Not all. Two of them seem to have more courage than the rest. They're coming down to challenge our landing. 
Must be used to close fighting, sir. They're carrying swords as well as spears. I wouldn't trust them, Captain. They look threatening. Send the ball over their heads, mister, and see what happens. Aye, aye, sir. Hmm. That stopped him suddenly. Well, they don't seem to know what to make of it, do they? Look out, sir. Here comes the stone. Well, that was too close. How's the range for small shot, Mr. Pickers, girl? Too far, sir. Could do almost no damage. Good. Fire a charge at the black who threw that stone. But be sure it's small shot. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Saunders, aim for that nearest black. Aye, aye, sir. That covered him, sir. Well, he can't be hurt by much by the way he's running. But the other man seems to be standing his ground. Why, bless my soul. Save me if he wasn't running to get his shield from that hut. Those are not swords they have. It's a contrivance for throwing spears. Oh, here they come. Look out, sir. Down, everyone. Throw spears. <laughs> Send some more small shot into him, mister. Right into him this time. Aye, aye, sir. Small shot. Let him have it, lad. And so Captain Cook, landing on this new soil, claimed it in the name of the British government and called the harbor Stingray Bay. But because of the profusion of plant life, it was quickly renamed Botany Bay. Years later, the English government saw in Australia an opportunity to rid itself of the many lawbreakers that overflowed its prisons. Consequently, in 1787, Captain Arthur Phillips was dispatched with a convoy of prisoners to form a penal colony at Botany Bay. But not all of these were murderers and thieves. Small offenders, guilty of nothing more than petty misdemeanors or political differences, were branded as criminals, and without the merest form of grading, were transported to Australia. We take you to an English country estate in 1788. Oh, Morton... I want to have a word with you. Yes, Sir Charles. There seems to be quite a lot of unrest and hard feeling against me in the village lately. Ah, you've been too easy with them, I think, sir. A little discipline is good for them. Yes, yes, I know. You've been telling me that ever since I put you in charge after your father died. I merely enforce the laws, Sir Charles. My father was exceeding lax in that matter. Yes, yes, so you've pointed out before. But it comes to my ears that the wood at the lower break has been closed to the villagers. Why is that? They've been cutting down trees in that part, sir. But that's where they've obtained their firewood ever since I can remember. What regulations have you made regarding the lower break? Anyone entering the wood must have written permission from me. I don't like it, Morton. I repeat, I don't like it. Have you found any of the villagers in there since you made the ruling? Uh, No, Sir Charles. I've had a little trouble with the foresters in enforcing the order. I don't wonder at it. They're all fine men. Well, if you catch anyone in there, I insist upon having them brought to me before any punishment is administered. Do you understand, Morton? Very good, Sir Charles. Good night, sir. Oh, William, what's come over, Sir Charles, that we have to steal our firewood by the light of a lantern? It's not, Sir Charles, Mary. But Master Morton, the steward, is responsible for these here changes. But don't he worry, wife. Hodgkins is on duty in here tonight. He'll not begrudge us a sack full of kindling. Well, we have enough now. I'm afraid to stay longer, William. Let's be a-going. Well, I'll just split this one piece and then we'll be off. So, you want to obey the laws, eh? Oh, William. Hodgkins, take that lantern from the woman. Uh, Master Morton, sir. I was just taking a little kindling to keep the house warm. Uh, did you have permission to enter this wood? Uh, no, sir, but your father always allowed Ah, uh, My father was a soft-hearted fool. Oh, Master Morton, sir, how can you say that? What's your name, fellow? Uh, Will Bright, sir, and please, sir, to keep that pistol pointing down. I'm not going to run. If you did, I'd send a ball into you and you know it. Is this woman your wife? Yes, sir. Well, the government's found a place for rascals like you. You'll be charged with trespass and thievery, both of you. But, Master Morton, sir, we didn't mean to be a stealing. We've always Hold come here... Hold your to... tongue, woman. The laws are going to be obeyed in these parts. Don't they worry, wife. Sir Charles will not let us be armed because of this. Sir Charles will know nothing about it. You'll be taken to the county prison at once. And if I have anything to do with it, you'll both be on the next prison ship bound for Botany Bay where you can steal from the air than blacks. <laughs> The 
history of the penal colony at Botany Bay is written with the military harshness of the period. Dark days of despotism which characterize all such undertakings. But out of the darkness, with the unfailing strength of true pioneers, have come the men who saw into the future. The colony was moved northward to Port Jackson. Volunteer settlers came from England bringing sheep and cattle. Van Diemen's Land, now called the island of Tasmania, was colonized. Then came the Great Drought, which forced exploration past the blue dividing barrier of mountains and led the way into Victoria and one of the richest districts of the country. Transportation of convicts to the New World was discontinued, and the mother country was given the task of dispatching the right type of immigrant to the colonies. The young country developed slowly, but in 1851 came a discovery that changed the steady advancement to a headlong rush. Hurry up, lads, hurry up. Get them horses on it. We are due to leave inside a minute and nobody is going to say that this branch of Cobb and Co. was behind time. Go on, hurry up. All those ready to leave, driver? Yes, sir, we'll be off in half a mo. Good. Is there a man called Hargraves here? I say, driver, have you a Mr. Hargraves among your... Yes, yes, here in the coach. I'm Hargraves. What do you... Why, Martin, how did you know I was here? Ah, oh, Graves, you old sinner. What do you mean by passing through here without letting me know? I didn't have time, old man. The stage only stopped here five minutes, you know. When did you get back from California? Just a week ago. I was going to write you, but thought I'd better wait and see if my hunch was right first of all. Your hunch? Great Scott. What mad scheme have you got in your mind now? Listen, when I was in the gold fields in California... I noticed they made their biggest strikes on ground, identical in formation, with some that I know of out Bathurst way. I'm on my way now to see if there's anything to the coincidence. All right, all right. Everybody seated. We're off. All right, old man, I went let you know how I get off. All right, Hargraves, good luck. Hargraves found gold at Bathurst. Then came the discoveries at Ballarat in Victoria, which heralded the romantic, roaring fifties. Within a month, 70,000 people were in the fields feverishly seeking the precious yellow metal. As was inevitable, lawlessness entered and the government imposed licensing regulations. Bush ranging became a real profession. Mail coaches and miners were robbed. Gold was free for the taking. To hold the great human avalanche in check, the price of digging permits was raised. More police were sent to the fields and licenses were rigidly inspected. This was too much for the free-thinking miners. They rebelled and gathering all available licenses, made a bonfire of them in full view of the authorities. Troops were called to put down the rebellion. The miners entrenched themselves behind a stockade on Eureka Lead. And on December 3rd, 1854, Australian diggers made history in the trenches for the first time. Are the boys getting some rest, Raffaello? Sure, Mr. Lara. He's got a plenty of rest. He's making much a snore. Good. They need it. It looks as if the military are going to leave us alone for a few hours because it's Sunday. I expect them to attack last night. You've made a pretty job of that stockade, Vern. That is as much could be done in the time, Peter. Tornan is making his rounds now. What time is it? By the watch, it's at four o'clock, and Rathalo is so much tired. Hmm. We'll soon be sun up. The both of you had better get some sleep. There they are! They've come! You may be in a second! that Sunday morning, the military triumphed, but victory in a greater sense was with the miners. Their fight for freedom at the Eureka Stockade brought a closer understanding from the government. After many weeks of public sympathy and waiting, the leaders of the revolt were brought to trial. In a crowded courtroom, the historical incident is closed. Peter Lalla, you and your associates have been brought to trial on charge of high treason against the Crown. You have been tried by a jury of your peers. 
and disregarding every damning shred of evidence against you, they have returned a verdict of not guilty. <laughs> Order! Order in the court! Order there! Felix, Sergeant, stop this noise at once. I'm doing my best, Your Honor, but they've gone mad. Those two men dancing on that table. Arrest them. Arrest them at once and bring them before me. All right, Your Honor. Hey! You two are under arrest! Under arrest! Come here! This is an outrage. The verdict was bad enough without this unseemly demonstration. Do you realize this is a court of law? Are those the two men, Bailiff, who were making so much noise? Yes, Your Honor. They're two of the spectators. Very well. Without any further preliminaries, I sentence both of you to seven days in jail for contempt of court. Thus, the only punishment for the whole uprising fell upon two innocent spectators. Victoria flourished. With the gradual disappearance of surface gold, the majority of the diggers migrated to the land and started farming. Expeditions opened up the country back or beyond. Such names as Ayr, Sturt, Gregory, Stuart, Burke, and Wills have taken most of the mystery from the never-never lands of the interior. North, south, east, and west have been covered, yet some parts still remain unknown. After years of tender nursing, the Federation of States was accomplished, and Australia emerged a commonwealth. A capital apart from all contending cities was sought, and Canberra, the bush capital, 204 miles distant from Sydney, was established. But the loyalty of young Australia to the homeland was to be further tested. November 9th, 1914, on board the Australian cruiser, Sydney. Barney, will you take a look at this, sir? What is it, Gold? An SOS from Cocos Island, sir. They say there's a strange warship approaching them. Hey, go wild, better quit. the Emden. What's that coming through now? Same message, sir. We sort of stopped in the middle. Here, Bowles. Take this message to Captain Gossip at once. Aye, aye, sir. And pray that we're the lucky ones to go after her. We're not far from the island, are we, sir? About 50 miles. Lord, I hope we get the order to swing out of the convoy and engage her. Here it comes. Now, sir. Cruiser Sydney, proceed to Cocos Island. Under full steam, engage enemy craft. That's it, sir. That's it. Inside four hours, the enemy raider Emden was a shapeless mass of scrap iron on the north beach of Cocos Island. Later, the Australian troops made history at the Dardanelles. On every front, the Australian soldier proved his worth. And now, Anzac, the word coined from the phrase Australian and New Zealand Army Corps for telegraphic purposes, is synonymous with supreme courage and spoken of with reverence in every land. This amazing country has grown rapidly. Her enormous sheep runs provide the world with more than a quarter of its woolens. Queensland, with her tropical climate, raises an abundance of luscious fruit. Through constant struggle, the men of the Mallee Wheat Belt have given the world a grain that is eagerly sought for the quality and quantity of its flour. And still come the settlers, and still more wasteland is cleared for the golden harvest. But Australia has given the world more than material things. Forty-five miles from Melbourne, and shaded by immense gum trees, stood an old house which in the early days heard the first notes sung by one of the most beautiful voices of the world. It was here that Nellie Mitchell caught the music of nature and, as Nellie Melba, sang her golden-voiced way into every heart. Royalty and peasant alike paid tribute to her golden voice. For years, the capitals of the world paid homage to this Australian nightingale. But Melba longed for the land of her birth, to see again the tall white gum trees and the flash of yellow wattle in the bush. After 16 years of absence, Melba landed at Brisbane and started the train journey south toward Melbourne, along the route of which she knew her aged father would be waiting to see her. And as the train approached Albury, the heart of the singer quickened with love and excitement.
No, no, Maddie. This hat won't do at all. No, I won't wear it. Oh, now look what it's done. Now you'll have to do my hair all over again. Oh, Madame must not upset herself. It will take but a moment for Marie to arrange it properly again. But which hat shall I wear? Oh, I must look my best for Father, and we'll be in the station in a few moments. There, there, Madame. You must not worry. You see? It is done. But the hat. There, Madame. The mirror. Does that please you? Dear me. However, did you manage it? Why, oh, it's perfect, Marie. I think we are approaching the station, madame. Yes, my gloves. Where are they? Here, madame. And my parasol. Oh, listen. Such a great crowd of people. They are here to welcome you, madame. Just as it has been ever since we arrived in Australia. But these are my people, Marie. My dear father somewhere among them. Quickly, I can't wait another moment. Oh, he's here somewhere, madame. You must be patient. The crowd is so great. Yes, I know. But he's such an old man and very frail. That's why I'm so anxious to... I beg your pardon, madame Melba. You are expecting to meet your father here? Yes, yes. Where is he? Has anything happened to him? Oh, please be calm, madam. I am a doctor. Your father is a very frail man. And the excitement of your coming, I'm afraid, was just a little more than he... Uh... Oh, he's ill. Where is he? Take me to him. Take me to him at once. Oh, very well. He's lying at a house quite close to the station. Will you come with me, madam? This is the house. You must be very quiet when we go in. If he's had a stroke, doctor, is there a possibility that he won't recognize me? It is very likely that he won't, madam. Uh, madam Melba, this is Mrs. Griffiths, who has been caring for your father. Won't you come in, please, madam Melba? Is he really very, very ill, Mrs. Griffiths? Won't he know me when he sees me? Don't worry, my dear. I think he'll know you all right. But we must be very quiet. He's in this room, lying in bed. Oh, oh how frail he looks. May I kneel by the bed? Of course, my dear. Oh, Try no. not to disturb him. Look, he's smiling. Oh, he knows me. Father. Father, to come home after all these years and find you like this. <laughs> oh, I'll never, never leave you again. The train must go on to Melba without me. No. No, Nelly. You... You must go on. But, Father, dear, I... Uh, you must go on. No, oh. no, do not disappoint me. Oh, but, Father, I've come home. My, my little girl, sing to me, lass. Sing now? Oh, but how can I sing with my heart almost breaking? Nelly, please. Yes, yes, I can. I can always sing for you, Father. Let me open the organ for you, my dear. The only known history of Australia is a story of pioneers, and history is still in the making. On November 12, 1919, two Australian brothers, Ross and Keith Smith, accompanied by Sergeant Shires and Bennett, left London, England to reach Australia by air. Flying through winter weather proclaimed by experts to be absolutely unfit for aerial navigation, these pioneers pressed on. Over France, Italy, Egypt, India, Siam, and Java they passed. And surmounting all obstacles, on December 10th, 1919, landed at Port Darwin, North Australia. (laughs) 
Since then, many Australian names have blazoned themselves across the sky. It was from this land that Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, with his Southern Cross, appeared, and later in another plane disappeared into the blue. But the years have added charm to this peaceful nation of fighting men and women. The harbor at Adelaide still holds its mellowed, old-world atmosphere. Western Australia greets the traveler out of the Indian Ocean with her beautiful black swans. Queensland welcomes giant ships into the very heart of her modern city of Brisbane. The Northland raises its cattle on rich verdure, and the twin cities of the island of Tasmania provide the peace, rest, and beauty so necessary to the inhabitants of a thriving continent. Once more, the hawser that binds us temporarily to land is released. The gap of blue water between widens. And as we watch the city of Sydney float gently away, we marvel at this land of flowers and industry, of beauty and courage, whose men and women in a few short years have tamed the might of nature and made Australia what she is today, a rich and gracious queen of the sea. I invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call.